Okay. Seems to be taping. Um. Okay, good. I was gonna say, for some reason it stopped. Actually, if you happen to notice January, if it stopped taping, let me know, because I think it stopped two seconds ago. I'm sorry to you. So what I want to do is go through the whole ZVAC test. So we talked about systemic, we, and we did the tutorial on it, systemic or objective violence. We also talked about subjective violence, which is the violence you can see. And we also talked about symbolic. And that, and he's really, as we said last week, drawing on Benjamin to set these up. And he's going to talk, in what we're doing today, towards the end, he's going to talk about divine violence. So then, I mean, that's where we're going to go with it. So having said that, I'm going to start, we ended at the end of chapter two. So I'm going to start, or sorry, we ended just before the second reflection. Fear thy neighbors. I'm going to start there. And he's talking also about biopolitics. So he's, he's saying that biopolitics has become a politics of fear. And it's a fear of the other. He says on page, this is around page 487, he says, what happens in, remember he's talking about the post-political. So he says, we're existing in a post-political world, and we kind of contested that last week. And he's saying that rather than having political politics, what we have is a biopolitics. So what happens in a post-political biopolitics, according to Zizak, is the tension between the reduction of humans to bare life, or what he and others call homo sacer, is that there's a tension between this reduction of humans to their life and the sacred excluded other who has no rights at all. No rights with respect for the vulnerable. No rights that respect the vulnerable. He says, quote, page 47, the experience we have of our lives from within, the story we tell ourselves in order to account for what we're doing is fundamentally a lie. The truth lies outside what we do. So we say that what the narrative we give ourselves for what we're doing in politics is in fact, is in fact a lie. He, he calls our politics a politics since World War II of meta-forgetting. And this is where he brings in the term fetish disavowal. That's on page 53. We engage in, in what he calls meta-forgetting, what he calls fetish disavowal. And of course, our fetish, he, he traces it back, and I think I, I said this last week, that the fetish is a substitute for the mother's missing penis. So by focusing, and so he goes through this, or I'm going through this to link it to what he's saying. So Freud says by focusing on the mother's feet, when the little boy looks up her skirt, he can deny what he knows, and that is that she doesn't have a penis. What Zizak says, and it's supposed to be castration anxiety. Because when a little kid sees that, then it's like the fear that he will not have a penis. Um, so what Zizak says is that he says, and fetish disavow is really interesting because we do it all the time. I think it's one of his most interesting concepts. Because in a sense, you know, you, it goes like this. I know, but I don't want to know that I know, so I don't know. I know it, but I refuse to fully assume the consequences of this knowledge so I can continue to act as if I don't know. He says, that's what we do in politics. That's what we do in our associations with other human beings. You, you know, okay, I mean, just an example. I mean, we can come up with lots of examples. It's, it's on page 53, and it's the very last line of the last full paragraph there the very last three lines. So you know you know, you can't live on minimum wage, right? In Toronto, which will be one of the discussions and speeches today at the, at the rally. Um, but the Ho Society pretends that you can. 
In a sense, it pretends that you can purchase all the consumer products, etc., pay your rent each, living on minimum wage. And we, you know, people that don't live in minimum wage engage in a meta forgetting what a meta forgetting what it's like to try and live on that. And so it's a fetish disavow. We all know it's impossible. It's impossible. Yeah, it's going good. It's impossible to live on what's minimum wage? Ten. Eleven twenty-five. Eleven twenty-five. Okay. So it's really impossible to live in Toronto on eleven twenty-five, right? But we all pretend, unless we're very politically aware, that we can do this and keep up a particular lifestyle. That's called fetish disavow. It's also what Zizek refers to as meta forgetting. He then moves on to make a distinction between the universal or universality and otherness. Now, Zizak has a lot in this book. I'm just hitting the highlights because Zizak is also responding and carrying for a number of, forward a number of thinkers other than Benjamin. He's carrying forward Lacan, for example, Marx, Heidegger Nietzsche. He is also, there's someone else that he's, oh, Badu. So all of these come into play in his book. So he'll be making references that you can pick up throughout to other thinkers. When he's talking about universality and otherness, he, he takes a look at Schmidt's friend enemy. So he goes back, he's also talking about Schmidt. He takes a look at the friend enemy, and he fits the neighbor in there, coming out of Christianity. So the neighbor, coming out of Christianity, and also in terms of friend-enemy distinction, is the unknowable other who deserves our unconditional respect. Whereas the enemy, using Schmidt, so the neighbor's going to fall into the friend category, whereas the enemy, using Schmidt, is the absolute other. What Zizak notes is what Schmidt notes, and that is that there's no longer an honorable enemy. That what's happened is that the enemy is seen as not part of universality. And so this is a direct pickup on Schmidt. His, the enemy's reasoning is seen as foreign to us. So you've got an absolute other enemy and you've got, in terms of the friend and under there, the neighbor, you've got, in terms of the neighbor, love thy neighbor, which is a, is a Christian phrase. And Zizak flips it a bit. He says, embedded in this Christian phrase, love thy neighbor, is the violence of marking off the inhuman dimension of the neighbor. He says, the neighbor becomes incompatible with universality because you've set them outside as the neighbor. Which allows him to get to this really interesting claim. He links the inhuman dimension of the neighbor with the suggestion on page 56, which is one of my favorite suggestions, actually. So if you go to page 56, and it's before he gets to the poem there, it's about love. But before he says that, he says, what resists universality is this inhuman dimension of the neighbor. And he links this inhuman dimension of the neighbor with the suggestion, quote, that it is for this reason that finding oneself in the position of beloved is so violent. And he then he adds to Lacan's claim. He says, love is giving something one doesn't have that's Lacan's definition of love. Giving something one does not have, he says you have to supplement it with to someone who doesn't want it. So he's playing with that, and he's playing with that in terms of the fact that the neighbor is, is set out as not universal. That this properly in human dimension of the, the, the neighbor relates to the position of the beloved. He then, later in the chapter, 
which is chapter two. Later in the chapter, he contends that humans exceed animals in their capacity for violence simply because we can speak, which takes them back to the symbolic, maybe I put symbolic here, which takes them back here to say that there's, that there's violence, structural, and viol structural violence embedded, ontological and structural violence embedded in language itself. <clears throat> On page 65, he says, what this means, quote, is that language itself, the very medium of nonviolence, of mutual recognition, to go back to Hegel, because Zizek's always influenced by Hegel, involves unconditional violence. Language itself, the very, very medium of nonviolence, of mutual recognition, involves violence itself. It involves unconditional violence because it is structurally there in the symbolic, it's structurally part of language. Being, according to Heidegger, occurs in and through language, as it does for Lacan, that is, we come into existence in violence as beings. which on page 67 allows Zizak to say, or to claim, that this ontological violence, that's violence, the reality of violence, is the founding gesture of every communal world. Because every communal world is founded in language. Now reflection three, or chapter three, it's called a blood dim tide is loosened. And we talked about that in um, seminar, but I just want to go over it really briefly. So he's looking at a particular suburb in France. It's called clippy sur bois it's, in the, it's an eastern suburb of Paris. It's 2005. The vast majority of the population are Arab Muslims from Algeria, Tanzania, and Morocco. So we know immediately that those were colonial holdings of France. And he says what's interesting, there's a divine spark in this violence. What's interesting about this violence is that there is no demand except for the demand to be recognized universally as citizens, and it's a demand based on an actual fact that they are. Hey, folks. So it's a demand for recognition based on citizenship, and they are citizens. So the only demand there is this demand for recognition. But the Paris, page 77, or 76, the Paris outbursts were not rooted in any kind of concrete economic protest. They were not an assertion of Islamic fundamentalism. Rather, page 77, the riots were simply a direct effort to gain visibility. Go to page 77. What the, what the protesters wanted and demanded at the bottom of the page was to be recognized as full French citizens, which they were. But they weren't treated as such. Now, I'm going to go down to the next part on 81, what he does is link or situate the Paris and the French riots that came after that in 2005 in a series with direct terrorist attacks and suicide bombings. And he does it to prove that they're not the same. He says the difference, of course, is that the Paris outbursts were a form of divine violent event that wanted nothing other than recognition in the Hegelian term of recognizing the other. Whereas the terrorist attacks were carried out on behalf of meanings that religion provides. So he's saying that, that any commentator or any system that links these two together is making a big mistake. One is based on recognition inside of the universal. The other are obviously based on, on taking apart that universal. Then he talks about how the West, which is us, can't really understand terrorist attacks, page 86. 
we can't understand them, and I've thought a lot about this actually, they can't, because they don't fit our standard opposition of evil as egotism and disregard for the common good, and good as the spirit of an actual readiness for sacrifice. <laughs> Sorry. In the name of some higher cause. the activity meets the higher st highest standard of good. <coughs> okay, so I'm just going to sit over here and get away from the chocolate. But. So the argument there is that the evil, we see only the evil good goals. <coughs> Sorry. Are killing a population in the name of a cause but that particular cause, in the eyes of those people doing it, has the highest good. And he says it's very difficult for Western secular people, religion, politics to get their head around this. Does that make sense? And he says that's one of the problems that we have in not being able to respect what we consider our enemies because we really can't understand it. And so that's on page 87. And then he goes to Freud, and he suggests that somewhat the answer somewhat lies in Freud's knowing that the true opposite of egotistic self-love is not altruism but envy and resentment, which makes me act against my own interests. In a sense, then, the true evil that happens here is not doing it for the common cause you believe in, but it's actually sabotaging. It's a self-sabotage that happens. So what he's trying to say there is that, on the one hand, Western knowledge and thought can't understand this because they can't understand something that manifests as a killing of others and is evil can be seen as being a greater good. They just can't get it. And on the other hand, what the people engaging in the action can't understand, in a way, is the self-sabotage that this brings about of, of their demands. So you've got both sides not really understanding it. So what Zizak would do is he would do a dialectical Hegelian bringing together of this. And so in, in, in Reflection 4, which is, he, he kind of builds in terms of Kant's antinomy, or antinomies of pure reason, he takes a look, and he does a really good job on this, right? So he takes a look at the state of Israel and Palestinian territory. And he uses that as a case study. And he says that, you know, people question when he goes there, speak. And he says, and for anybody in the room that's been in Israel, he's absolutely right. He says that what's obvious when you enter Israel is that, quote, it's a state which hasn't yet obliterated the founding violence of its illegitimate or origins and repressed them into a timeless past. So if you go to page 117 is where he says that. Um, I've got a film on that which I shot one of the things I wanted to shoot there, he says that one of the reasons Israel is so upsetting to all countries 
is because you can really see past state power. One seventeen, he says, what the state of Israel confronts us with is obliter the obliterated past of every state power. So when I read this, I decided I was going to, um, I was going to do a, a, a film shoot called Shooting the Blur, where, and I, and I had, uh, I was working with a couple of students, where we went out and we shot all the markers of different states that had been there, and then we would, and they all disappear, obviously, right? And then we would blur each one. Um, and you can see the real markers of Palestinian state, for example, by, which is very interesting, um, of what was and still is Palestinian land um, by, by the um, cactus trees, et cetera, that were around. So you can actually see markers of, of you know, high cactuses that have grown where people had, in 1948, left their land and after that. So you can see, you can see different markers there of different power structures. And I think in the film I showed you last week on, on uh, Zizak, the one I was looking for today, you could, I, was, I showed some of the Jordanian barracks, so those are left over. Some of the British mandate stuff is left over. You can actually you can see some of the Roman stuff. Like you can see sort of relics of previous state powers. So this brings to mind for Zizak, and this is a really clever way of looking at it, and I hope you get the, what he's, he's not, it's not a joke, he's just using it as a comment. So I don't know if you've seen Brecht's Three Penny Opera, but if you haven't, I'd really, you have, yeah. So if you haven't, I'd really recommend it. It's incredible, right? Um, and one of the things in, in Three Penny Opera is one of the, the people in it says, what is the robbery of a bank compared to the founding of a bank? Which is a very good comment in terms of the founding of state violence. So what is the robbery of a bank? compared to the founding of a bank. It takes you back to Benjamin's idea of the, the founding and maintaining of violence. And Zizak on page 117 proposes a new variation to this model. He says, what is committing an act of terror? So he's obviously referring to terrorist actions there, or resistance, to a state power waging war on terror. And he's making He's making those the same, that, that same sort of statement. So, so what is committing an act of terror to a state power waging war on terror? And then if you go to 124, and I thought this was also very interesting, because he talks about fetish disavowal. And here's a very good example he provides of fetish disavowal in the um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or you could say the Israeli occupation. Um, he says, interestingly, this is 124, Israelis are the most atheistic nation in the world. Around 70% of them do not believe in any kind of divinity. And then of course you have the Orthodox people that live there as well, right? The reference to the land thus relies on a fetish disavowal. I know very well that God does not exist, but I nonetheless believe that he gave us the land of greater Israel, end quote. So that, that's a fetish disavowal. On the one hand, you know that you, know, you don't believe in God. On the other hand, you, will, you believe, or you use it as a strategic belief, that, that you were given this land by biblical reasoning. So do people get that, what's meant by that? Because what Zizek's trying to do is do a really sort of comment what he's doing is a critique, basically, a critique of Israeli foreign policy. But he's not calling it a critique of foreign and, and, and domestic policy. He's not calling it a critique of the occupation. He's just providing certain, and it's one of the ways that Zizek does critique. He's providing the example of the bank robber and the example of fetish disavowal. And he's also saying one of the troubling things about the state itself is, is this fact you go in and you see the it's right there. They have it. Hasn't been, you know. They haven't disappeared in a sense. Um, you see previous markers of a previous um, rule, I guess. And then you think, oh, that's interesting. So then you can start looking for them in other countries too, and you can see them in Canada, for example. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, 
blinking good, but then having to kill for it. Yeah, but I also can't really understand dying from a cause, okay? I mean, I can understand it much the way <laughs> I can understand something abstractly. I probably wouldn't do it. But then hasn't those, haven't those kind of ideas been propagated in Western culture, like during wartime or even like, I don't know, I think of so many examples where that is sometimes idealized, and I think it's... Like dying for a cause. Yeah, I was going to say, that's great. I think you're right. I think there's one distinction. I think Zizek would say there's one distinction. In wartime, when you're dying for a cause, you're doing it for the state. Remember, go back to Schmidt, where he talks about the state is the only entity that has the, the, the backing to ask you to die for it. And Schmidt's, I think that's a distinction. I'm not saying it's a right distinction. But then when he goes to make it seem similar in that line where he says, when he compares terrorism to the state power using it, like as a war yeah. on terrorism. I don't know, I just felt that like he brought them together. He absolutely brings them together, you're absolutely right. He's saying, in fact, the biggest terrorists are states. Like he, he brings them together, he says like what, you know, really what is terrorist actions against a state in the face of a state who can wage a war, wage a war on terror? And so the biggest terrorist action there in Zizek's read would be the state that can wage a war on terror. So yeah, because that's what you were suggesting, right? Yeah, so he does bring them together and then he says, you know, the state that has all of the force at its hand to go to Sorel is, is a bigger terrorist in a sense against populations that don't fit into its, its, I don't know what you would call it, into its mandate of citizenship or how they, um, and so yes, he is doing that. Zina is very clever and he, and he picks it up very well. He's very clever to show, because he's Hegelian in a sense, you know, He's very clever to show the opposite. And then in the synthesis is that it's, when it comes together, usually the opposite is stronger than the one that's claimed to be. For Zizek. That's good. Yeah, anybody else on that? It's a very good observation. So when you get to reflection five, it's talking about tolerance as an ideological category. And what struck me on this is he's trying to talk about universality, as I've got up there. He's using the do here, which we haven't read, but he, it, it'll be obvious to us in a second. He's saying that the key moment of any theoretical, ethical, political struggle is this rise of universality out of a particularity. So if you go back to, for example, um, Benjamin, it's this rise out of the particularity of fighting against a state that's in power and then getting yourself in power, you become the new founding form of violence and maintaining violence. So that in, so in a universal dimension, an in itself becomes a for itself. To go back to the Hegel view. And is experienced as universal. And this universality then gets inscribed in a particular context, and that context is taken to be universal, which goes back to Yasmin's observation. Once the context is taken to be universal, then that is seen as what is good. And what's reacting against that is seen as like terrorist actions, even though what's being reacted against could be a bigger form of, of terrorism. And that's his claim. <clears throat> so he gives an example here he gives an example of a work of art that's able to survive being torn from its original context. So if you go back to first term and you think of some of the, what we talked about in terms of, of Hegel's um, introductory lectures on aesthetics, but you can also think the one he uses is Nietzsche. And he says on page 152, in the case of truly great art, each epic reinvents and rediscovers it. He goes to Nietzsche because he's very much influenced by Nietzsche. He says Nietzsche was reinvented throughout the 20th century. So you know you have the Nazis using and Nietzsche's sister helping them to use it, the conservative heretic, sorry, excuse me, heroic proto-fascist Nietzsche, where the overman is the is is linked with fascism and Nazism. So you have that. Then you have the reinvention post-World War II, and in the 40s before that, 
the reinvention of what became the French Nietzsche, the Nietzsche used by Vitaille, the Nietzsche used by Foucault. And then you have my favorite Nietzsche, which is the, the Nietzsche and, and, and really changed the face of how we read Nietzsche, and that's Deleuze's, Deleuze's understanding of Nietzsche. It's sort of dominant cultural studies. Now, what Zizek says, and I like this because then it allows you to get some of these texts that are admired. Um, and it goes along with what Said says, but it, it gets you to get some of the texts that are really mired in a particular time and place out of there and use what's valuable out of them, if there is anything valuable. So if you go to page 154, and he goes through offers, he goes through Wagner's offers there, and he says, and I don't know if people um, have been to, have you guys been to opera? Okay, here's the deal. Before you get old, you should go to opera because they have really great rates for people 30 and under. So you can score really good seats that I have to pay lots of money for um, because they're trying to develop a, an audience over time. Now, if Godfrey Damlon was on at the COC here, I don't think it's still on, but Honestly, if you like theory, or even if you don't like theory, if you like high drama, spectacle, bourgeois art form that shouldn't be a bourgeois art form, um, and you're under 30, just, you know, you go, I think you either can book ahead or you go into whatever they got left that night, you could have really great seats, they'll give it to you. Um, for like, I think it's 30 bucks, which is really good because, you know, to have really good opera seats, and, and the person I go to opera with can't see very well, so we're usually second row, so. They're, they're really expensive, let me just say. Um, I've always found it really campy, not for the usual reasons of opera. Zizak's got a book on Wagner. So what he's saying there before he gets to what I'm gonna read, he takes a look at Wagner and he says, okay, well, you know, he goes through the operas and he says, um, like Percival, and he says, like, there's racist stereotypes right in there, right? There's a particular racist stereotype against the Jewish character there, which, um, and he says, but that doesn't need, the newer productions don't have that. You can, like, strip that, you can kind of strip that out, but it has to be recognized it's there, but then, but then it's, but then it's no longer part of the importance of what's there. It has to be decontextualized. So he says, if you go to 154, I want to try and read this so it sounds better than I'm saying. It's rather that, so it's the first paragraph, the last five, six lines. It's rather that the tension between the basic universal frame of Nietzsche's thought and its particular historical contextualization is inscribed into the very edifice of Nietzsche's thought, is part of its very identity in the same way that the tension between the universal form of human rights and the true meaning of the historical moment of their inception is part of their identity. But if you decontextualize it, you've got a different, you know, and I probably if I didn't, I would have to say to go back to January here, um, I would have to say that if I didn't do both, I would have real trouble reading Nietzsche. Okay? And so what, what and, and also, you know, it would be ridiculous for people putting on Wagner to, to freeze it in the time, the racist time period that it was written. Right? So, so what Zizak's trying to say is that often this decontextualization has more value over time than the, the one that is mired in the particularity. I was trying to go for particularity in the particularity of the time. So he's arguing for sort of a universal decontextualization that then can fit the times you're in. So I mean, if you, so sometimes when you go to opera, it's staged in a contemporary, and you can see contemporary references there, which is kind of interesting, because they're, they're um, trying to make a different particular political comment. So in a sense, if it's stuck in the particular, which is on the next page, it's going to mask the universal. And, and Zizak is really arguing that it's important also to get to the universal. And then he goes to Apocalypse Now. Now, I don't know if you've seen the film Apocalypse Now. If you, have people seen it? Yes or no? Okay, you have. You have had. Yes, okay. So if you haven't seen it, it's worth seeing. It's also worth reading Darkness at Noon, which is, yes, a particularist racist text, and yes, one recognizes that, and then, as Said says about darkness, darkness of news, heart of heart darkness. darkness. Sorry, darkness <laughs> of news. Something else. Heart of darkness. And yes, and then one, so one recognizes that, and Said actually writes about um, heart of darkness, and then writes about what comes after that, in the sense of how people have 
then take it what's said there and use it to build their own arguments. So the ending there where, you know, uh, Marlon Brando's playing Kurtz and Kurtz is gone like, I'm gonna put this in quotation marks, he's gone crazy basically is what he's done, but, they, but the way it's presented is as having gone primitive, okay? So, and he's, he's set himself up as a king and he set himself up, as Zizek says, as the primal father. And they have to send out Willard, the American son, to kill him. Because, he's an, he's, because he was a uh, Navy or Army off, like, he was military, he's still in the military and they have to get rid of him. He's gone, he's gone missing in a sense, he's no longer carrying out whatever duties they have, which is probably killing people. He's gone missing, he set himself up as a king, and Willard is sent out to kill him. And Willard does kill him, but he realizes he's also killing what he could become, what, what he has a danger of becoming himself. So there's, so it's based on, he's using that to build into Abu Ghraib to say that it's this fetish disavow at the heart of the American system and of the British system. And that is, you deny that it ever happened. It gets covered up. Well, it's a lot more difficult to cover stuff up now because what you've got now, of course, that last scene in Apocalypse Now, if it was a true scene, would probably be on film somewhere. On 177 to one, 176 to 177, at the end of the chapter, he talks about Abu Ghraib. And of course, you remember the, the images that expose the American soldiers in Abu Ghraib, um, where they are making the political prisoners who are blindfolded uh, go through all sorts of sadistic torture. And they're laughing about it. And these images get, these images get leaked or posted. Now, Zizak says something very interesting about it. He says on 177 to 17, or 176 to 177, but I think I have something more important I wanted to say about that. Because he talks somewhere there about the fact that, it, that this whole argument that it, you know, the, the US government's argument, political argument, that it doesn't represent America, that the basically it provides a very bad image of American soldiers. And Zizek says what it does actually is expose to the countries under American occupation, who the US is considered barbaric in many cases, it exposes to them the underside of American democracy. It exposes, so what, what ends up slipping out there is precisely what America does not want the rest of the world to see. And that is the underside and the opposite that goes towards maintaining American, American democracy. So if you go to 176, I'll quote this because he says it better than I just did. Um, it's the last big paragraph there, about two-thirds of the way down, and he says, being submitted to humiliating tortures, the Iraqi prisoners were effectively initiated into American culture. They were given a taste of its obscene underside, which forms a necessary supplement to the public values of personal dignity, democracy, freedom. Bush was wrong. What we are getting when we see the photos of the humiliated Iraqi prisoners on our screens and front pages is precisely a direct insight into American values, into the very core of the obscene enjoyment that sustains the US way of life. And for reflection six, divine violence. What he suggests there and that's starting on page 178. He's, he's talking about, of course, divine violence coming out of Benjamin is justice beyond the law. Zizak suggests that the entire history of humanity can be seen as the growing normalization of injustice. And opposite the violent enforcement of justice in the face of injustice is what he calls the figure of divine violence that can be just or unjust. But it explodes onto the scene. 
links what happened at the World Trade Center and the visual images that one keeps seeing or the re remembered images of the World Trade Center that have been documented in Hitchcock's The Birds, where the birds are flying. And if you haven't seen The Birds, it's worth watching too, Hitchcock. Um, and Zizak has a couple of books that look at, look at Hitchcock, primarily Hitchcock's films. So he says that Hitchcock had a handle on divine violence. He, it comes from nowhere. It's unjust, it's an explosion. So he's picking up Benjamin's argument on this. And, he's, and what he does, what Zizak does, is link the 9-11 shots of the plane approaching and hitting the Second World Trade Center as a real life replay of the scene from, of one of the main scenes from The Birds. So go to page 181. And he talks about it there. He says, a second paragraph, there's a Hitchcockian resonance to the iconography, iconography, yeah, of the 9-11 catastrophe, the endless repeated shot of the plane approaching and hitting the World Trade Center. It roughs like a real life version of the famous scene from the birds in which um, Melanie advances towards the bay pier in her boat and the, the birds come and attack her. The boat, the most violent candidate for the divine violence, or for divine violence, and, and Zizek's building to this. He says the most, the most obvious candidate for divine violence is resentment, resentment, what Nietzsche calls resentment. Now resentment doesn't have a political affiliation. He's, what Zizek says is resentment can explode in mob lynchings and did. It can also explode in revolutionary terror. If you go to page 198, Zizak defines divine violence there. And he defines it, and he's using Benjamin. At the very bottom of the page, the last four lines, divine violence is an expression of pure violence, of the undeadness, the excess of life, which strikes at bare life regulated by law. Mythical violence, of course, is violence that demands sacrifice. And mythical violence, to go back to Benjamin, he talks about mythical violence next. Mythical violence demands sacrifice and it belongs to the order of being. Divine violence belongs to the order of what somebody like Bidu would call a bent. And, you know, what Bidou calls event is very much influenced by what Benjamin, how Benjamin describes divine violence happening. And that is the eruption, it, it erupts, um, it, it's almost like it comes from nowhere, it doesn't come from nowhere, it's as if it comes from nowhere, it's not expected, it erupts, and only later can you tell if it actually made sort of a real difference or not. So the example that Zizak was using in terms of the Paris suburb, that would be divine violence erupting, making a demand for recognition. Divine violence, you, there's sort of no objective criteria in which you can use to, do, to define something as divine violence, Zizak says. The only one is that it's spontaneous in a sense, it erupts, it explodes, it explodes in the face of injustice, he says something crucial, I think, and that is the same act that to an external observer is an outburst of violence can be divine violence to those engaged in it. Now, Zizek always takes a run at love. So he says, when he's talking about love and cruelty, he says, this domain of pure, of pure violence, outside law, outside legal power, Law that, or violence that's neither law founding nor law sustaining or maintaining. So he's using Benjamin's categories there. He says, one of the realms you find this in is love. And he says, in love, it's a violence that raises love out of other above the natural limitations of the human and transforms it into an unconditional drive. On page two, 204 to 205. 
So it's this violence that erupts, it raises love of other above the natural limitations of the human. People do things they could not believe that they could do if they, you know, because of love. Um, and transform it into an unconditional drug. Then in the epilogue, and I will have it finished, yeah, by 12.30. In the epilogue, Zizak says, we've traveled, so he goes, he gives a, a summary of what he's done. And he calls it travel. He says, we've traveled from rejecting false anti-violence to the endorsement of emancipatory violence. We've chastised violence that collaborates in rendering invisible the fundamental forms of social violence. He says, we've pointed out and we've chastised violence that, that renders or collaborates in rendering invisible the forms, the fundamental forms of violence in our society, that is systemic or objective violence and symbolic. We've also talked about in certain localized acts, it's better to do nothing than engage in something that's going to make the system run more smoothly. He then suggests that the, the threat today is not passivity, but what he calls pseudo-activity. What he calls pseudo-activity. The urge to be active and participate to really mask the nothingness of what's going on. He's particularly hard hitting on academics where he says academics intervene, they participate in meaningless debate where the most difficult thing is to step back. Then he poses two things at the end on page 217 that we may not agree with, I don't know. One goes back and forth on this. I think Zizak himself would have to say, it depends what, what's going on. It depends what period you're living in. So he ends by saying, or he closes with the claim, quote, that voters abstention is thus a truly political act. It forcefully confronts us with the vacuity of today's democracies. However, the other side of that, as we all know, is voters abstention, not voting allows a candidate to get in that nobody wants. So that's really a problem. So he, in a sense, would have to, and if you, if you remember from the American election how hard, um, so sort of the last week or so, Obama, both Obamas, Michelle and, and Barack Obama were out campaigning and saying, look, you have to vote, you can make a difference. Like trying to move people from the idea of abstaining, because they can't make a difference. So you have to take a look on that one to see what particular type of election you were in. And then he ends the very last sentence in the book. Sometimes doing nothing is the most violent thing to do. And I think he says that because doing nothing may not keep the system running. But if doing nothing keeps a system running that's embedded in violence at the systemic objective and symbolic orders, then it's a problem. And, and that sort of builds right back to where he's talking about reflection. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to end there um, one minute before I said I would, which is great. And I'll write on the board for people that aren't here. So what we can do is go over to the IWD rally, march and rally at Berry Hall. And then because we don't have presentations today, we can...